welcome back to Disturbed Reality. In the chaotic carnival of human curiosity, our collective fascination with violence emerges as a twisted, mesmerising sideshow. Strapped into the roller coaster of our own morbid intrigue, we willingly plunge into the abyss of the human psyche, seeking the adrenaline that accompanies tales of brutality. Amid the seemingly endless subreddits and forums, we find ourselves inexplicably drawn to the macabre narratives that dance on the edge of societal norms. From true crime aficionados to horror enthusiasts, our digital arenas serve as a virtual coliseum where we spectate the visceral spectacles of human darkness. The allure of these tales lies not only in the shock value, but in the complex psychological cocktail that is stirred when fear, empathy, and curiosity collide. In this digital amphitheatre, we are both the gladiators and the spectators, navigating the fine line between repulsion and compulsion. The pixelated bloodstains on our screens become a canvas for our collective imagination as we grapple with the paradox of craving the very horrors that repel us in reality. The comment sections echo with a cacophony of opinions, theories, and armchair analysis, transforming the exploration of violence into a communal experience. We dissect the motives of criminals, analyse crime scenes like amateur detectives, and speculate on the limits of our own capacity for darkness. The anonymous nature of the online realm provides a mask for our own vulnerability, allowing us to confront the sinister without fully exposing our fears. Yet beneath the surface, our fixation on violence raises unsettling questions about the human condition. Are we drawn to the shadows because they reflect our own hidden desires? Or does the allure lie in the cathartic release of our own deepest fears within the safety of our screens. As we scroll through the digital tapestry of brutality, we must grapple with the uncomfortable truth that our fascination with violence is not a mere spectacle, it is a reflection of the intricate and often enigmatic facets of our shared humanity. The dark allure persists, pulling us deeper into the labyrinth of our own complexities where the line between observer and participant blurs in the flickering glow of the screen. In relation to the channel, primarily we have focused on depravities, murders and massacres caught on camera, all of which are far too easy to find online. However today, we take a look at serial killer lost media. When I say lost media, in reality, these items of content are more so suppressed and hidden, more so than lost, out of respect of the victims that said killers slain. Disturbing lost media has become a big subgenre within true crime in recent years. Not only does it satisfy our curiosity of the macabre, but it also tickles our desire to know the unknown and find the unfindable. Today we cover three pieces of disturbing serial killer lost media. Number 1. The Maury Travis Tapes Maury Troy Travis was an American serial killer who was named in a federal criminal complaint for the murders of two women, though he was suspected of killing many more. At the time of the murders, he was a hotel waiter and on parole for a 1989 robbery. While Travis claimed in a letter to have murdered 17 women, some authorities were doubtful, however others thought he may have murdered up to 20. He died by suicide by hanging in custody in St. Louis County, Missouri after being arrested for murder. Details of Travis's early life are sketchy. Records show he was born on the 25th of October 1965 in St. Louis, Missouri to a middle-class family. Travis, who lived in the Car Square public housing complex just northwest of downtown, attended various St. Louis public schools from 1971 to 1975. 
He was 10 years old when his family moved to a simple ranch house in Ferguson. Records show his parents divorced in 1978. The records also show that his mother remarried but divorced again in 1993. A neighbour in Ferguson described Maury Troy Travis as a quiet, respectful boy who sometimes mowed her lawn without being asked and also showed her how to use an electric hedge trimmer. She knew him by his nickname Toby and said he was a pleasant child with a soft heart. I don't believe he could kill a fly, she said. Other long-time neighbours said they have virtually no recollection of the boy due to his shy nature. On the surface, Marie seemed like a shy, timid, but ultimately a good kid. Though during his teenage years, he began fantasising about killing, and was said to have taken an interest in killing insects, and even allegedly killed a neighbour's dog. Records in Ferguson Florissant School District show he was enrolled in 1981 as a ninth grader at Ferguson Junior High School. By 1982, he was a student at McClure High School. Several students who attended McClure at the same time said they could not even remember Travis. Sue Hanan, a retired English teacher at McClure, said she immediately recognised Travis's name and photograph at the time of his arrest. She remembers him as a student in her basic English class for students who failed an earlier English course. She describes him as very quiet and withdrawn, incredibly quiet for a teenager. Even the quiet ones can be noisy sometimes, but not him, she said. School records show that Travis graduated in 1985. Other documents indicate he then served two years in the Army Reserve working as a medical and dental assistant. He also took a variety of jobs with trucking companies in the area, and even volunteered at a local nursing home. By 1987, at age 22, Travis enrolled at the Morris Brown College in Atlanta, a school with some 2,000 students and affiliated with the African Methodist Episcopal Church. At this point, it seemed Maury Travis was on the right track, seemingly suppressing the urges in which he experienced in his youth. However, after attending college, Maurice developed a $300 a day crack and cocaine habit, which prompted him to turn to criminality to sustain his deteriorating lifestyle. During this time, he dropped out of school and began robbing stores to fund his habit. Possibly at this time, his urges began to boil back to the surface, though he would pay sex workers for rough sex, which kept his dark side at bay for a few years. After a spate of robberies, one of which he used a fake gun, he was arrested and subsequently sentenced to 15 years in prison. However, Travis was paroled after five years and three months behind bars for the robberies, working in the prison's janitorial and food service areas, and overall, being a good inmate. He was released on parole in 1994, and moved into a home owned by his mother in Ferguson, Missouri. He got a job at a fine dining restaurant as a server in Chesterfield, Missouri, and was briefly engaged, which seemed to calm Maury's urges to kill that had been occurring off and on since childhood. It's also worth noting that Maury's co-workers and neighbours all viewed him as a respectful man, quiet but polite and helpful. Ultimately, the engagement didn't last long, and the couple separated, which seemed to be the straw that eventually broke the camel's back, giving Travis the reason he needed to act on his sick urges. He briefly went back to prison between February of 1998 to January of 1999 after breaking parole due to the possession of illegal drugs. Upon his release, Maury would finally satiate his thirst for blood, after his release, Maury began turning his house's basement into a makeshift torture chamber, and even drew up plans to build cells under his house to hold his victims. At this point, all he now needed was his first victim. Between the 30th of July 2000 and the 25th of May 2002, 15 women's bodies were found in the St. Louis area, all of whom seemed to die of strangulation, though the bodies that were not too badly deteriorated and decomposed 
also shown signs of prolonged torture. The final method of killing earned Maury Travis the nickname the Bi-State Strangler. Maury would make sex workers his primary target, particularly those who were addicted to drugs and desperate for their next hit. Maury would take advantage of this. He would offer them money to take them back home, where he would have sex with them, let them smoke crack, before usually dressing them up in white robes with black sunglasses, before eventually tying them up. His routine was almost ritualistic, though he would make it out to be part of his fetish. Eventually, he would then tase his victims before taking them down to the basement where he would torture, abuse, and SA them for unknown periods of time, before eventually killing them by strangulation. Maury Travis would also film his victims in their final moments. There are actually some clips available online, all of which are traumatic to watch. In one clip, he can be seen observing as one of his victims smokes a crack pipe. There are also other horrific clips, including one showing a victim tied against a beam in his basement with handcuffs as Maury berates her. In another clip, Maury can be seen standing over the body of one of his victims. The video is censored, but Maury states in a documentary type style, This is first kill number one. First kill was 19 years old. Name? I don't know, and I don't give a fuck. First kill was nice. There is also some dispute whether the first victim on the tape, who still seems to be unidentified, was actually Marie's first kill. The first body discovered linked to Marie was that of 61-year-old Mary Shields, and some police suspect she may have been his first victim. On the 15th of May 2001, yet another body was discovered, this time of 36-year-old Teresa Wilson. A year after the body was discovered, with her murderer still on the loose, a journalist of the St. Louis Post dispatch newspaper wrote an article about the unsolved murder of Teresa Wilson. Less than a week later, Travis anonymously sent the reporter a letter and a map. The letter read, Dear Bill, nice sob story about Teresa Wilson. Write a good one, and I'll tell you where many others are, to prove I'm real. Here's the directions to number 17. Search in a 50-yard radius from the X. Put the story in the Sunday paper like the last. The reporter informed the police on the letter and map he received, and initially, they suspected it to be a hoax, but they searched the area. And after combing through the area, they came across the remains of an unidentified woman. The letter really was the bi-state strangler. Little did Travis know, however, his arrogance would be his downfall. A cybercrime investigator in the St. Louis police force made a huge discovery. He searched through every online mapping service to find out what website the killer used to print the map from. After hours of searching, he realized the map came from Expedia.com. Police subpoenaed Expedia.com, and they asked to obtain a list of everybody who printed the specific map location between the release of a news article and the day the letter was received. The list only contained one single IP address, which led police to the address of Marie Troy Travis. On the 7th of June 2002, FBI agents and a police detective went to Maurice's home. They spoke with him, and they were tipped off that he seemed agitated and frustrated. The ground level of the house all checked out and seemed normal. However, police soon went down to the basement and discovered a variety of items and evidence proving that Marie was the killer. Blood splatters were on the wall and ceiling, and various tools including a stun gun, duct tape, gloves, rope, and other items were found. As well as the items, police even found blueprints of cells Travis intended to build in his basement to keep his victims chained up for longer periods of time to prolong their torture. Police also confiscated VHS tapes to be combed through, and one in particular caught their eye. It was simply dubbed Your Wedding Day, 
which was strange as Travis wasn't married. Travis was arrested for the murder of two women, and the wedding day tape confirmed his guilt. The video is said to be extremely harrowing, and it details the psychological and physical torture of at least one of his victims, as well as S.A. and her eventual murder. Travis was placed under 24-7 suicide watch in jail, as police were deciding what to charge him with. However, on the 10th of June 2001, Travis was found hanging dead in his cell, despite the jail carrying out checkups every 15 minutes. However, it seemed they missed two checks back to back, giving Travis all of the time he needed to end his existence, robbing the families of his victims of justice. In regards to the videos, they were so disturbing and graphic that the chief of police ordered counselling for all of the officers who saw them. There are snippets of some of the tapes online, all of which are incredibly unsettling. The final kill count of Marie Troy Travis is still unknown, with estimates ranging between 12 and 20 murders. Number 2. The Moore's Murders Tape the Moore's murders were carried out by Ian Brady and Myra Hindley between July 1963 and October 1965 in and around Manchester, England. The victims were five children, Pauline Reed, John Kilbride, Keith Bennett, Leslie Ann Downey and Edward Evans, aged between 10 and 17 years old, at least four of whom were Irish assaulted. The bodies of two of the victims were discovered in 1965 in graves dug on Saddleworth Moor. A third grave was discovered there in 1987, containing the remains of two other victims, more than 20 years after Brady and Hindley's trial. Bennett's body is also thought to be buried there, but despite repeated searches, it remains undiscovered. Ian Brady was born in the Gorbals area of Glasgow as Ian Duncan Stewart on the 2nd of January 1938 to Margaret Peggy Stewart, an unmarried tea room waitress. The identity of Brady's father has never been reliably ascertained, although his mother said he was a reporter working for a Glasgow newspaper who died three months before Brady was born. Brady's early life was chaotic. He was born in a working-class, poverty-stricken environment, and his behaviour throughout his youth was troubling, to say the least. Various authors have stated that he tortured animals, although Brady objected to such accusations. It was reported, for example, that Brady boasted of killing his first cat when he was aged just 10 years old, and then went on to burn another cat alive, stone dogs, and cut rabbits' heads off. Brady was accepted for Shorelands Academy, a school for above average pupils. Brady's behaviour worsened at Shorelands. As a teenager, he twice appeared before a juvenile court for housebreaking. He left the academy aged 15 and took various odd jobs. Brady had a girlfriend, Evelyn Grant, but their relationship ended when he threatened her with a flick knife after she visited a dance with another boy. He again appeared before the court, this time with nine charges against him, and shortly before his 17th birthday, he was placed on probation on condition that he live with his mother. He still had various brushes with the law for minor crimes, until, according to him, he decided to better himself. Deciding to better himself, he obtained a set of instruction manuals on bookkeeping from a local public library, with which he astonished his parents by studying alone in his room for hours. In January of 1959, Brady applied for and was offered a clerical job at Millward's Merchandising, a wholesale chemical distribution company based in Gorton. He was regarded by his colleagues as a quiet, punctual, but short-tempered young man. Brady liked to read, though the subject matter of said books were strange, to say the least. Brady read books, including Teach Yourself German and Mein Kampf, as well as works on Nazi atrocities. Myra Hindley was born in Crumpshaw on the 23rd of July 1942 to parents Nellie and Bob Hindley and raised in Gorton, 
than a working class area of Manchester dominated by Victorian slum housing. Her father was an alcoholic who was frequently violent towards his wife and children. The family home was in poor condition and Hindley was forced to sleep in a single bed next to her parents' double bed. Their living situation deteriorated further when Hindley's younger sister Maureen was born in August of 1946, and the following year, five-year-old Myra was sent to live nearby with her grandmother. Hindley's father had served with the parachute regiment and was stationed in North Africa, Cyprus and Italy during the Second World War. He had been known as a hard man while in the army and he expected his daughter to be equally tough. He taught her to fight and insisted that she stick up for herself. When Hindley was aged about eight years old, a local boy scratched her, drawing blood. She burst into tears and ran to her father, who threatened to lever her if she did not retaliate. Hindley found the boy and knocked him down with a series of punches. As she wrote later, at eight years old, I'd scored my first victory. Malcolm McCulloch, a professor of forensic psychiatry at the Cardiff University, written that Hindley's relationship with her father brutalised her. She was not only used to violence in the home, but was rewarded for it outside. When this happens at a young age, it can distort a person's reaction to such situations for life. In June 1957, one of Hindley's closest friends, 13-year-old Michael Higgins, invited Hindley to go swimming with friends at a local disused reservoir, but she instead went out elsewhere with another friend. Higgins drowned in the reservoir that day, and Hindley, a good swimmer, was deeply upset and blamed herself. She took up a collection for a reef, and his funeral was held at the St. Francis Monastery in Gorton Lane. Hindley's first job was as a junior clerk at a local electrical engineering firm. She ran errands, typed, made tea, and was well liked enough that when she lost her first week's wage packet, the other girls took up a collection to replace it. At 17, she became engaged after a short courtship, but called it off several months later after deciding the young man was immature and unable to provide her with the life she wanted. Hindley, at this time, also took weekly judo lessons at a local school, but found partners reluctant to train with her as she was often too slow to release her grip. She took a job at Bratby and Hinchcliffe, an engineering company in Gorton, but she was dismissed after being constantly absent after only six months in the job. In January of 1961, two worlds of darkness would collide, when the 18-year-old Hindley joined Millwards as a typist. She soon became infatuated with Brady. Hindley began a diary, and although she had dates with other men, some of the entries detail her fascination with Brady, to whom she eventually spoke to for the first time on the 27th of July that year. Over the next few months, she continued to make entries, but grew increasingly disillusioned with him, until the 22nd of December, when Brady asked her on a date to the cinema. Several sources state that the first movie they watched together was The Judgment at Nuremberg. Their dates followed a regular pattern, a trip to the cinema, usually to watch an X-rated film, then back to Hindley's house to drink German wine. Brady then gave her reading material, and the pair spent their work lunch breaks reading aloud to one another from accounts of Nazi atrocities. Hindley began to emulate an ideal of Aryan perfection, bleaching her hair blonde and applying thick crimson lipstick. She expressed concern at some aspects of Brady's character. In the letter to a childhood friend, she mentioned an incident where she had been drugged by Brady, but also wrote of her obsession with him. A few months later, she asked her friend to destroy the letter. Hindley began to change her appearance further, wearing clothing considered risque, such as high boots, short skirts and leather jackets, and the two became less sociable to their colleagues. The couple were regulars at the library, borrowing books on philosophy as well as crime and torture. Although Hindley was not a qualified driver, she often hired a van in which the couple planned bank robberies, 
though none of his plans were ever acted upon. Hindley claimed that Brady began to talk about committing the perfect murder in July of 1963, and often spoke to her about Mayor Levin's Compulsion, published as a novel in 1956 and adapted for the cinema in 1959. The story tells a fictionalised account of the Leopold and Loeb case, two young men from wealthy families who attempt to commit the perfect murder of a 12-year-old boy, and who escape the death penalty because of their age. Shortly after, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley would act upon their sick growing desires, and they would carry out their first murder on the 13th of July 1963. Over the next two years, the pair killed five children and teenagers. In chronological order, the victims' names are Pauline Reed, John Kilbride, Keith Bennett, Leslie Ann Downey, and finally, Edward Evans. The last murder took place on the 6th of October 1965. The crimes of the sadistic pair are incredibly hard to read and research, and I won't go over all five murders, though to paint a picture on how evil the pair were, we will explore two of the murders in particular the murder of Leslie Ann Downey, and the final murder of Edward Evans. We will start with the murder of Edward Evans. On the evening of the 6th of October 1965, Myra Hindley drove Ian Brady to Manchester Central Railway Station, where she waited outside in the car whilst he selected a victim. After a few minutes, Brady reappeared in the company of 17-year-old Edward Evans, an apprentice engineer who lived in Ardwick, to whom he introduced Hindley as his sister. Brady later claimed that he had picked up Evans for a sexual encounter. They drove to Brady and Hindley's home at Wardlebrook Avenue, where they relaxed over a bottle of wine. At some point, Brady sent Hindley to fetch Smith, her brother-in-law. Hindley's family had not approved of Myra's sister Maureen's marriage to Smith, who had several criminal convictions, including actual bodily harm and housebreaking. Throughout the previous year, Brady had been cultivating a friendship with Smith, who had become in awe of Brady, something that increasingly worried Hindley as she felt it compromised their safety. Hindley returned with Smith and told him to wait outside for her signal, a flashing light. When the signal came, Smith knocked on the door and was met by Brady, who asked if he had come over for the miniature wine bottles, and left him in the kitchen, saying that he was going to collect the wine. Smith later told the police, I waited about a minute or two, then suddenly, I heard a hell of a scream. It sounded like a woman, really high pitched. Then the screams carried on, one after another, really loud. Then I heard Myra shout, Dave, help him, very loud. When I ran in, I just stood inside the living room, and I saw a young lad. He was lying with his head and shoulders on the couch, and his legs were on the floor. He was facing upwards. Ian was standing over him, facing him, with his legs on either side of the young lad's legs. The lad was still screaming, and Ian had a hatchet in his hand. He was holding it above his head, and he hit the lad on the left side of his head with the hatchet. I heard the blow. It was a terrible hard blow. It sounded horrible. Smith then watched Brady throttle Evans with a length of electrical cord, and Evans' body was too heavy for Smith to carry to the car on his own, so they wrapped it in a plastic sheeting and put it in the spare room, with the intention of disposing of it later. After the murder of Edward Evans, Smith agreed to return the following morning with his dead daughter's pram to transport the body to the car, before disposing of it on the moor. He arrived home at around 3am and asked his wife to make him a cup of tea, which he drank before vomiting and telling her what he had witnessed. At 6.10am, having waited for daylight, he armed himself with a screwdriver and bread knife in case Brady was planning to intercept him. Smith called the police from a phone box on the estate. He was picked up by a police car from the phone box and taken to Hyde Police Station, where he told officers what he had witnessed in the night. Superintendent Bob Talbot of Stalebridge Police Division went to Wardlebrook Avenue, accompanied by a detective sergeant. 
Wearing a bread delivery man's overalls on top of his uniform, he asked Hindley at the back door if her husband was home. When she denied that she had a husband or that a man was in the house, Talbot identified himself. Hindley led him into the living room, where Brady was lying on the couch writing to his employer about his ankle injury. Talbot explained he was investigating an act of violence involving guns that was reported to have taken place the previous evening. Hindley denied there was any violence and allowed police to take a look around the house. When police asked for the key to the locked spare bedroom, she said it was at her workplace, but after police offered to take her to retrieve it, Brady told her to hand it over. The body of Edward Evans was discovered in the bedroom, and Ian Brady was arrested on the suspicion of murder. As Brady was getting dressed, he said, Eddie and I had a row, and the situation got out of hand. Though Hindley was not initially arrested, she demanded to go with Brady to the police station, taking her dog. She refused to make any statement about Evan's death beyond claiming it had been an accident, and was allowed to go home on the condition that she returned the next day. Over the next four days, Hindley visited her employer and asked to be dismissed so that she would be eligible for unemployment benefits. On one of these occasions, she found an envelope belonging to Brady, which she burned in an ashtray. She claimed she did not open it, but believed it contained plans for bank robberies. In the meantime, the police were uncovering more evidence and became convinced that Hindley was actively involved in the murder of Edward Evans and possibly other victims. On the 11th of October, she too was arrested and taken into custody, and she was charged as an accessory to the murder of Edward Evans. Police then searched the couple's house and found a myriad of evidence linking the demonic pair to the murders of the other four children and teenagers. Police found disturbing photos of Leslie Ann Downey, along with a 16-minute audio tape detailing her horrific torture. Both Ian Brady and Myra Hindley would be convicted of the five murders, and Brady was sentenced to three concurrent life sentences, and Hindley was given two, plus a concurrent seven-year term for harbouring Brady in the knowledge that he had murdered John Kilbride. Brady was taken to HM Prison Durham, and Hindley was sent to HM Prison Holloway. Both Brady and Hindley died in prison. One of the most shocking aspects of the case was the discovery of the 16-minute audio tape of Leslie Ann Downey's murder. The contents of the tape is still debated to this day, though a full transcript is available online, which is a harrowing read to say the least. Allegedly, the tape contains audio of Leslie being tortured by Brady as he berates her and tells her to shut up if he wants to go home to mummy. In the background, a Christmas song by the name of Little Drummer Boy can be heard playing. Police who listen to the tape claim it is one of the worst things they've ever experienced on the job, with some even requiring psychological help years later. The audio was played in court as Leslie's mother sat present listening to her daughter's final moments. A hushed courtroom listened, appalled by the petrified little girl's final moments. Two women in the court's public gallery held their hands against their ears as they heard her begging to go home to mummy, crying that her neck hurt, saying, I cannot breathe, please God why, what are you going to do with me? It's unclear whether police still have the audio recording of Leslie Ann Downey's torture, or whether at this point it has been destroyed. Regardless, the chances of it leaking are slim to none, which is a good thing. I could have gone into more detail into the Moore's murders, however, the case is one of the most depressing in UK true crime, and what the pair did to their victims is beyond demonic. Number 3. The David Parker Ray Tape David Parker Ray, also known as the Toy Box Killer, was an American kidnapper, torturer, serial therapist, and suspected serial killer. Though no bodies were found, Ray was accused by his accomplices of killing several women, and was suspected by police to have murdered as many as 60 people from Arizona and New Mexico 
while living in Elephant Butte, New Mexico, approximately seven miles north of Truthful Consequences. Ray was convicted of kidnapping and torture in 2001, for which he received a lengthy sentence, but was never convicted of murder. He died of a heart attack about one year after his convictions in two cases, the second of which resulted in a plea deal. David Parker Ray was born on the 6th of November 1939 in Bellin, New Mexico to father Cecil Leyland Ray, a native of Oregon, and mother Nettie Opal Parker, who had been born in Texas. During his childhood, Ray and his younger sister Peggy lived with his mother's disciplinarian parents, Russell and Dolly Parker, on a small ranch due to their poor financial condition. He was sporadically visited by his violent, alcoholic father, who would supply him with magazines depicting sadomasochist pornography. At Mountaineer High School in Mountaineer, New Mexico, he was bullied by his peers for his shyness around girls, which resulted in him abusing alcohol and other drugs. Ray's sexual fantasies of hearing, torturing, and even murdering women developed during his teenage years. When Ray was 14 years old, his sister saw his sadomasochist drawings and pornography pictures of bondage practices. As a result, Ray and his sister became estranged. Based on statements made by Ray, he is believed to have begun assaulting women as an adolescent. In an advisory message that was tape recorded by Ray on the 23rd of July 1993, he claimed, I've been raping bitches ever since I was old enough to jerk off and tie little girls' hands behind their backs. He even alleged to his first wife that he had committed his first homicide sometime in 1957 when he kidnapped a woman, tied her to a tree, and tortured and murdered her. However, authorities were unable to verify his accounts. After completing high school, Ray received an honorable discharge from the United States Army where his service included work as a general mechanic. Ray then worked as a maintenance man for the New Mexico Parks Department in Truthful Consequences, New Mexico, for the entirety of his adulthood until his arrest. The resort town, located approximately five miles from Elephant Butte, New Mexico, contained several local bars, which Ray frequented for victims. Ray then met 37-year-old Cindy Hendy, who worked at a state park in Truthful Consequences, New Mexico, and who was fleeing convictions on grand theft and drug charges in Washington State. They became romantically involved and bonded over their shared violent sexual fantasies. In a 1993 recorded message, Ray told his captives that they would be forced to sexually service Hendy as well as him. Ray was divorced four times and had two children, including his accomplice's daughter, Glenda Jesse Jean Ray. Glenda had tried to warn the FBI about her father's criminal activity in 1986. FBI agent Doug Belden recalled Glenda Ray's claims. She alleged that David Parker Ray was abducting and torturing women and selling them to buyers in Mexico. However, the allegations were so non-specific that the FBI were unable to arrest Ray. Ray sexually tortured and presumably killed his victims using whips, chains, pulleys, straps, clamps, leg spreader bars, surgical blades, electric shock machines, and saws. It is thought that he terrorized many women with these tools for many years, with the help of accomplices, some of whom are alleged to have been several of the women he was dating. Inside Ray's torture room, which was a repurposed cargo trailer located immediately outside his Elephant Butte, New Mexico property, and was called the Toy Box by Ray, included numerous sex toys, torture implements, syringes, and detailed diagrams showing ways of inflicting pain. There was also a homemade electrical generator used to electrocute his victims. In total, Ray is believed to have spent $100,000 on the trailer, fitting it with sex toys and torture devices. Reportedly, Ray constructed elaborate contraptions to confine his victims, such as fur-lined coffins and a makeshift pillory. In addition, there were also elaborate locks and pulleys to prevent his captives from escaping. A mirror was mounted in the ceiling above the obstetric table to which he strapped his victims so that they would be able to see themselves be raped and tortured. 
Ray also put his victims in wooden contraptions that bent them over and immobilized them, while he had his dogs and sometimes other friends fear them. Ray often had an audio tape recording of his voice played for his victims whenever they regained consciousness. In the transcript of his tapes, Ray detailed how he would occasionally release his captives after severely drugging them to induce amnesia to prevent women from reporting the assaults. A short excerpt of the transcript read as follows. I get off on mind games. After we get completely through with you, you're going to be drugged up real heavy with a combination of sodium pentothal and phenobarbital. They are both hypnotic drugs that will make you extremely susceptible to hypnosis and hypnotic suggestion. You're going to be kept drugged for a couple of days while I play with your mind. By the time I get through brainwashing you, you're not going to remember a fucking thing about this little adventure. Exactly how many murder victims Ray claimed over the years is uncertain, though investigators believed that he raped, tortured, and killed up to 60 individuals over the course of his life, but they have not been able to locate any of their remains. A diary that Ray kept detailed what he did to each victim, but it did not disclose where he buried their bodies. According to accomplice Cindy Hendy, Ray's fatal victims were dismembered and buried, dumped in the Elephant Butte Lake or in nearby ravines. After his arrest, Ray agreed to show authorities where he had buried his victims, but he died before he could do so, and Cindy Hendy was unable to assist investigators in recovering any possible bodies. The Albuquerque FBI in 2011 released hundreds of images of items that were collected during the investigation of Ray. The FBI believes that some of the items which included jewellery and clothes may have been taken from victims. The FBI, along with its law enforcement partners in New Mexico, is aggressively pursuing several leads in the search for remains of any possible victims of David Parker Ray, said Frank Fisher of the Albuquerque Field Office. We are asking family and friends of missing people to look over these photographs and contact us if they recognize any of these items. In total, Ray has been linked to three murders where the victims were identified. Billy Ray Bowers, 53 years old, disappeared from Phoenix, Arizona on the 25th of September, 1988. On the 28th of September, 1989, the body of an unknown man wrapped in blue tarp was found by a fisherman at McCree Cove at Elephant Lake in Elephant Butte, New Mexico. No identification was found on the body, and it was determined that he had been shot in the back of the head. The unidentified body was ultimately identified as Bowers in March of 1999, when authorities made dental record comparisons. In 1986, Bowers was a co-owner of Canal Motors, a used car business that was on North Van Buren Street in Phoenix, Arizona. The owners employed Ray, who worked as a mechanic and was described as very talented, but also often in conflict with Bowers. While incarcerated, Cindy Hendy stated that Ray told her he had killed Bowers and dumped his body in the Elephant Butte River. 22-year-old Jill Suzanne Troyer was last seen at the Frontier Restaurant in the 2400 block of East Central in Albuquerque, New Mexico during the late evening of September 30th, 1995. She had gone to a bar with friends earlier, then went with her girlfriend, Glenda Jean Jessie Ray, when they left to go to the restaurant. Witnesses reported Glenda and Troyer had an argument. Glenda later told police she left Troyer at the Frontier restaurant and left with her father David, and that she and David went to the Elephant Butte Reservoir in southern New Mexico. Troyer has never been heard from again. Ray wrote detailed accounts of sexual tortures and burials of victims, including one in which he described as an Asian woman who fitted Troyer's description. Sylvia Marie Parker, 22, was a homeless woman living on the shores of Elephant Butte Lake and who was an acquaintance of Ray via his daughter, who supplied her with methamphetamine and cocaine. Parker was also the mother of two children and was living with them in a tent she had borrowed from David Parker Ray. 
The police later discovered that Parker's boyfriend at the time was Dennis Yancey, one of Ray's so-called playmates. Parker disappeared on the 5th of July 1997 when she was abducted and subjected to several days of torture before accomplice Yancey strangled her to death under the orders of Ray. Dennis Yancey took police to where he disposed of the body with David Parker Ray and Cindy Hendy, but the body had been moved. Yancey suspected and the police support the theory that Ray came back to move the body later in case Yancey ever had a softening of his conscience and confessed. Cynthia Vigil was abducted from an Albuquerque parking lot by Ray and his girlfriend Cindy. She was taken to Elephant Butte, confined to the trailer and tortured. After three days of captivity, Vigil escaped from the trailer on the 22nd of March 1999. To escape, she waited until Ray had gone to work, and then unlocked her chains with keys that Hendy had left on a nearby table. Hendy noticed Vigil's attempt to escape, and a fight ensued. During the struggle, Hendy broke a lamp on the captive's head, cutting her open, but Vigil unlocked her chains and stabbed Hendy in the neck with an ice pick. Cynthia Vigil fled while only wearing an iron slave collar and padlocked chains. She ran down the road seeking help, which she got from a nearby homeowner who took her in, comforted her, and called the police. Her escape led officials to the trailer and instigated the capture of Ray and his accomplices. Police detained Ray and Hendy. Another victim, Angelica Montano, came forwards with a very similar story to that of Cynthia Vigil. She said that she had been held captive by Ray after Hendy invited her to the house to pick up cake mix. After being tortured and tortured, Montano convinced the pair to release her along the highway. She was picked up by an off-duty law enforcement officer and told him what happened, but he did not believe her and left her at a bus stop. She also later called police about the incident, but there was never any follow-up. Police identified another victim, Kelly Garrett, from a videotape which dated back from 1996. Garrett was found alive in Colorado after police identified her from a tattoo on her ankle. She testified that she had gotten into a fight with her husband and decided to spend the night playing pool with friends. Ray's daughter, Jessie, who knew Garrett, took her to the Blue Water Saloon in True For Consequences, New Mexico, and may have drugged the beer she was drinking. She offered Garrett a ride home, but instead took Garrett to her father's house. Garrett said she endured two days of torture before Ray drove her back to her home. Ray told her husband that she had found the woman incoherent on a beach. Her husband didn't believe that she couldn't remember where she had been, and Garrett said she did not know what to tell the police, so she didn't contact them. Her husband sued for divorce, and Garrett moved to Colorado. She was later interviewed on the show Cold Case Files about her ordeal. The Federal Bureau of Investigation sent 100 agents to examine Ray's property and surroundings, but no identifiable human remains were ever found. While awaiting trial, Ray spoke to FBI profilers and said that he was fascinated by the kidnapping of Colleen Stan and other sexually motivated kidnappings. The FBI had spoken to Ray as early as 1989 in connection with his business manufacturing and selling bondage-related sexual devices. A judge ruled that the cases for crimes against Cynthia Vigil, Angelica Montano and Kelly Garrett would be severed, meaning that Ray would be tried for each separately. Prosecutors said this damaged their case, as each woman's story would otherwise have corroborated and bolstered the other's accounts. The judge also ruled much of the evidence found in the trailer during the 1999 raid could not be admitted in the Garrett or Montano cases. The first trial for crimes against Kelly Garrett resulted in a mistrial after two jurors said they found her story unbelievable. Ray's defense was that the sex trailer was part of Ray's fantasy life and any sex was consensual. After a retrial, Ray was convicted on all 12 counts.
A week into his trial for crimes against Vigil, Ray agreed to a plea bargain and was sentenced in 2001 to 224 years in prison for numerous offences in the abduction and sexual torture of three young women at his Elephant Butte home. The plea deal was to obtain leniency for his daughter. Prosecutors stated that the surviving victims had approved of the deal. Ray's daughter, Glenda Jean Jesse Ray, was charged with kidnapping and criminal sexual penetration. She pled no contest and received a 30-month sentence with an additional five years to be served on probation. In 1999, 27-year-old accomplice Dennis Roy Yancey pleaded guilty to the 1997 murder of 22-year-old Mary Parker in Elephant Butte. Yancey confessed to helping Jesse Ray lure Marie Parker into captivity in her father's trailer. Yancey said that Parker was tortured and that Ray forced him to strangle the woman to death. Prosecutors noted that no forensic evidence was found to tie Parker to the Rays. Dennis Yancey was also charged with kidnapping, two counts of conspiracy to commit a crime, and tampering with evidence. He was sentenced to 30 years. The Rays were not charged in Parker's murder. In 2010, Yancey was paroled after serving 11 years in prison, but the release was delayed by difficulties in negotiating a plan for residence. Three months after his release in 2011, Yancey was charged with violating his parole. He was remanded to custody, where he remained until 2021, serving the rest of his original sentence. In 2000, Cindy Hendy, an accomplice who testified against Ray, received a sentence of 36 years for her role in the crimes. She was scheduled to receive parole in 2017. She was released on the 15th of July 2019, after serving the two years of her parole in prison. On the 28th of May 2002, Ray was taken to the Lear County Correctional Facility in Hobbs, New Mexico, to be questioned by state police. He died of a heart attack before interrogation could take place. Cynthia Vigil later founded Street Safe New Mexico, a volunteer harm reduction non-profit that works with sex workers and other vulnerable people living on the streets. The case of David Parker Ray is most noted for the 50-minute tape in which he made for his newly captured victims. In the tape, David Parker Ray, in a sinister but matter-of-fact tone, would describe what would happen to them over the period of their captivity. He would express with glee what he was about to do to his victims, with threats of murder if they made it hard for him. He also stated that they would be released if they complied. There are voice acted versions of the full tape online, which can easily be found on YouTube. Even though they are voice acted, the subject matter is utterly disgusting. It said that the original tape is still in possession of the FBI. Also, David Parker Ray would frequently take video recordings of the essay and torture that he would inflict upon his victims, and the videos were used in the case against him, ultimately getting him convicted. The case of David Parker Ray without doubt contains artifacts of suppressed media, from the audio tape to video and images. With many of his victims still alive, it's pivotal that the material never sees the light of day. But anyway, that is the video. I hope you enjoyed it, if you can enjoy this sort of content. This video's gone on way too long. When I, when I started recording, I, I didn't think it would be this long. So here we are. Um, once again, thank you for the support, it's much appreciated. If any of you have any topic recommendations, please feel free to let me know, uh, follow me on Twitter, DM me, um, link will be in the pinned comment below. Also, if you could follow us on Twitch, that would be much appreciated. Uh, and yeah, as always, stay safe, and I'll catch you on the next one.